Good evening, all peoples. Welcome to what we believe will be the final installment of our series, Why We Believe What We Believe. I think so. <laughs> One day we will start over, I'm sure. Uh, we have been on Statements of Faith 17 and 18, which are our end times statements. Uh, number 18 is the personal eschatology, personal end times statement. And number 17 is the cosmic es eschatology. 18 talks about what the end of your life looks like. What is the end of your life personally? And then what is the end of time hold for your life personally? Cosmic eschatology is, in general, what does the end of time look like? And so we actually started with number 18, and we backtracked to 17. Uh, we said that when you die, uh, if you are his, you go to be with the Lord. We didn't give a lot of detail on what that looks like, but we are in the presence of the Lord. In the, at the end of the age, when Jesus returns, uh, the dead in Christ shall rise. The, those who are alive and remain will rise with them, with them and meet the Lord in the air. And then we talked a little bit about what comes after that. Depending on your view of the millennium, either there will be a 1,000-year period of peace and prosperity under the kingship of Jesus Christ on earth, followed by Judgment Day and eternity or we'll go directly into eternity uh, after Judgment Day. Um, and I said last week that uh, the whole idea of the millennium was probably the least important lesson I've ever taught, not because it's not important for us to dig into the Bible and try to figure out what it's saying about that, but because at the end of the day, or rather at the end of the age, what really matters is, are you his? And if you are, then we're going to be in a, an eternal state that we'll be talking about tonight that will be a very good thing. And if you're not, you'll be in, a, in an eternal state that will be a very bad thing. So let's turn now to statement of faith number 17. And I'll just reread it. We believe in Christ's imminent personal return and great glory in his millennial reign and in the everlasting dominion. We took a little bit of time to work through the beginning of that, and then we said, these two little phrases, millennial reign and everlasting dominion, we want to come back to. We came back to millennial reign on last week. This week, we want to look at everlasting dominion. We use the verse Daniel 7.14, uh, which says that his dominion is everlasting. And so that pretty much closed the case on that. But we wanted to come back and say, all right, what does that look like? And in order to get a picture of what that looks like, we're going to spend most of our time and thinking tonight in Revelation 21 and 22, the last two chapters of the Bible. I will tell you that much of what I'm going to share tonight will be of a speculative nature. I do not intend this to be, by and large, teaching doctrine to be held on to, but rather to try to inspire you and to help you to think outside of our normal daily thoughts and to begin to imagine. You may remember the song that came out a couple of decades ago, I Can Only Imagine. It's a good thing for us to imagine what it's going to be like, and so we're going to do a little bit of that tonight. I think there are a few things that we can see that we can have a pretty good sense of that is what it's going to be like. But some of the things we'll discuss will be imagining what that might be like. So, let's get started. Before we turn to Revelation 21, I want to look at two passages. One uh, in the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus is speaking, and the other one from one of Peter's letters. And I want you to see something there uh, that I think will be important as we open up. Matthew 24, 35. Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away. 
but my words will no, by no means pass away. Peter, picking up on this theme in 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 5, says this, They willfully forget, he's talking about those who are scoffing and mocking in the last days, they willfully forget, forget that by the word of God the heavens, of, uh, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. Notice real quick what he's saying there. At the beginning there was a land or an earth that stood up out of the water, then there came a flood, and the earth was flooded with water. And he's speaking there of judgment. Once upon a time there was a judgment on the earth, and, and, and don't make the mistake of thinking there, there won't be another one. But the next one is not going to be one by flood. We know that from the rainbow. Uh, but Peter begins to get at what a little bit of this judgment might look like. Verse 7, But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away. Okay, Jesus just said the heavens, heaven and earth will pass away. Now Peter is saying, the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be? You should be holy, you should be godly, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. Because the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for what? New heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Now, keep those backdrops in your mind. Jesus says heaven and earth will pass away. Peter is saying look for a new heavens and a new earth after the heavens and earth pass away. Enter John, upon receiving the revelation of Jesus Christ, writes this at the beginning of Revelation chapter 21. <laughs> Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first, first earth had passed away. Now, why did I bring up these statements from Jesus and Peter? Because Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and he's speaking very plainly. He's not trying to kind of tell stories. He's not speaking metaphorically. And Peter is writing an epistle, which we take to be, among all of the Bible genres, we tend to interpret epistles the most literally of any of the Bible genres. If there's any Bible genre that you're going to interpret literally, it's going to be the epistles. And so Peter is saying, and Jesus is saying, heaven and earth will pass away, and there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Now, why am I making a point of this? Because... We can't just read Revelation 21.1 and say, well, John is having this vision and it's all metaphorical. Because Jesus and Peter already said this about the new heavens and the new earth, the heaven and earth passing away and the new heaven and the new earth coming. So I do believe that Revelation 21.1 is to be taken literally, a new heaven and a new earth uh, after the first heaven and the first earth pass away. Now, into a little bit of speculation here. Is the new literal new earth a different earth? A different place from the current earth? Or is it a remake of the current earth? It probably doesn't matter for our purposes. The point is, you better be there. Um, but I would guess that it's a remake or a refurbish of this earth. And I would say that for two reasons. Number one, God doesn't waste anything. And number two, there are some precursors in Scripture that I'll talk about a little bit later. In the back half of that verse 21.1, it says, there was no sea. Now, I'm actually going to spend a little bit of time talking about this. Um, and again, some of this will be speculative, but we'll talk a little bit about there will be no sea, okay? Um, how do we interpret this? Is it literal or is it figurative or whatever? Okay, well, first option is it's literal. There will be no sea on the new earth. 
And uh, Pastor Jeff, in his series last year, uh, more or less went this direction. And he, in fact, uh, gave us a, what I think is a pretty good uh, reason or, or, or kind of putting two things together. A little bit later, it says there's no sun or moon because God himself is the light uh, of this place. And so if there's no moon, there's no tides, and you don't need a sea. Okay, so that's the literal interpretation. There's no sea. Okay. Uh, throughout Scripture, sea is symbolic of Gentiles. And so um, it might be that this, the idea that there's no sea is a symbolic reference or a figurative reference to there's no evil in that place. Uh, the Jews are thought of as being associated with the land, and that's good. These are the good guys. Gentiles associated with sea, these are evil, these are the bad guys. And so it could just be a simple way of saying there's no sea there. In other words, there's no evil in this place. All the, all the evil will already be gone after Judgment Day. Um, how much it matters? Um, probably not much, unless, except for the fact that we need to answer the question of whether there will be a last king, king crab. The other, uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, my firstborn son, we were talking about this a little bit, and uh, actually, I'm not even sure we were talking about this. I think he just kind of went and came out of nowhere and said, Dad, do you think there will be sushi in heaven? <laughs> and uh, I said, well, I, probably. I, I don't know. Um, here, here's the thing. First of all, it does say a little bit later that there's no death. Does that mean no human death, or does that mean no death death? Because if, not, if, the, if there's no fish dying, then there wouldn't be any sushi, would there? But one of the things I want to point out right here is, if you're disappointed, which I might have a tendency to be, if I think there's no sea, therefore there's no Alaskan king crab, and I begin to get disappointed that for eternity I will no longer be able to eat Alaskan king crab, I've missed the point, haven't I? Because you can't get into a mindset that thinks, oh, these are things that I like on earth, and if they're not there anymore, that's going to be a disappointment. No, I promise you, there will be no disappointments. Even if we are all vegetarians, which, which, which sounds really disappointing, I know, I get it. But here's the thing. If that were to be the case, it would still taste way better than all the food that we're eating right now. I know you can't imagine that, but whatever vegetables and fruit taste like, they're going to taste that much better. And, and you will have no disappointment about what you're eating. Pastor Jeff talked about last, uh, last year when he did his end time series, the, the way that the eye perceives color, and there's so many colors that that are out there, and the human eye can only perceive a, a small percentage of those colors. I would say the same for taste buds, the same for hearing, the same for all of our senses. Our senses are going to be so heightened that uh, it, it will really, we will, we will be taking things in in such a marvelous way. It's, it's really going to be marvelous. And uh, whatever we eat there will be delicious. And, and you have to stay away from the mindset that there would be anything uh, in this place that would be in any way disappointing. All right, I'm still talking about there's no C, all right? So a third uh, option, which I'll do very quickly because I don't think it's right, is uh, that the Aegean Sea, so John is writing from the Isle of Patmos, and he's looking across the Aegean Sea at his brothers and sisters in the church at Ephesus, and he's saying there's no sea. In other words, there's nothing that's, there's no more separation between me and you at that time. I don't think that's the right interpretation because that would be him putting his own thing into this vision, and he's having a vision. The interpretation is for us to interpret, but the vision is from the Lord, so uh, that one doesn't seem to, to, to hold water if I can use that phrase. The last, yeah, yeah, sorry, it, 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 not, it wasn't on purpose, that was just, that was just boom, right there it was, and I went there. 
Here, here's another option, and this is the one I would lean toward. I think it's literal, like option one, but with a little caveat. I think it's literally, there's no sea, and it's in conjunction with the new heaven and the new earth. Okay, New heaven and new earth is literal, and the, there was no more sea was literal. But here, here's what I think is really happening here with this statement of there, there's no sea. If you remember back to 2 Peter chapter 3, let's think about this for a minute. For a minute. It could be that this is really referring to the way in which the earth is destroyed. Okay? I didn't read this in any of the commentaries, so I could just be way out to lunch here, but th- go with me here for just a minute. I think this could be a reference to the fact that what is coming is what I might call creation 3.0. God created the heavens and the earth in the beginning. That's creation 1.0. What happened? There was a global flood, and out of that global flood, uh, God brought forth creation 2.0. There was a reboot. There was a remake. Creation 1.0, you remember it talks about God creating, bringing up the land from the sea, separating the sea from the sea, and so forth. Uh, and of course, the flood, the earth was covered by water. So in, in the first two creation scenarios, there's this earth covered by water, and out of the water comes land. In this scenario, we've just had the earth scorched by fire and burnt to a crisp. And I think this may be a way of John saying, there's no sea. In other words, this is not the same kind of dis- destruction, and it's not the same kind of recreation that happened the first two times. It's going to be coming out of barren nothingness, land, wasteland, not water. Does that kind of make sense? There's also another little pattern here. If that's, if that's true, that we have the idea of the flood and then a, kind of a rebirth out of the flood back in the day, and now we have this new creation, this rebirth out of the fire, uh, all of a sudden, John the Baptist's prescription becomes kind of a type of this. I baptize you with water, but one is coming who will baptize you with fire. It becomes almost a type or a pattern of these two um, destructions of the earth and, and recreations. So when John the Revelator says there was no sea, I believe his vision is affirming for us, since the earth was destroyed by fire, it's without form and void, but as opposed to the first two creations, which were covered in water, this one is bone dry. Now, picture the order of events for just a second. And there might be some details that we might mix in here, but let's just get the basics, okay? End of the age, Jesus comes back. Uh, either there's either a thousand year period of peace on earth or there's immediate judgment day and then, and then the, the new earth. Okay, so think about this. Judgment day, uh, those who are good are judged at the Bema. Let me, let me just say something about this real quick. The Bema, B-E-M-A, the Bema judgment seat, the judgment seat of Christ is a distinct concept from the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment of Revelation 20 is when God judges those who are evil uh, and uh, sends them uh, to the lake of fire. The Bema seat of Christ uh, is the judgment that Paul talks about for believers in which the primary reason for that is for us to receive our our rewards. Now, I might say a little bit more about this in a a little bit, but... um, We are not going to the judgment seat um, to receive a a sentence or to receive uh, negative results. We're going there to receive good rewards. Now, whether those two seats occur simultaneously or whether they occur 1,000 years apart, that's a different question. But conceptually, they're different things that are going on there. So that being said, again... Jesus comes back, we have Judgment Day, whether it's a thousand years apart or at the same time. We have Judgment Day. Um, Those who are uh, damned and banished to eternity in the lake of fire, go there. Uh, The earth has been scorched and is uninhabitable. We, at the judgment seat of Christ, um, are, are given our rewards, 
We are, um, we come together with him in union. We have union with Christ and with each other. And then we descend, if you will, um, whether that's literal or whatever. We, we kind of come and inhabit this uninhabitable earth, which God will remake or recreate creation 3.0. So I think it's possible that there's no sea, but then there becomes a sea later once he recreates it. Um, Again, a little bit of speculation there, but I'm I'm just holding out hope that there's Alaskan king crab okay, and sushi for my son. All right. So that's the new heaven and the new earth. Again, I do believe it's literal. Look at now verse 2 of Revelation 21, and we'll go a lot quicker now, where we get a different concept, which is the concept of the new earth. Jerusalem. I'm reading now from Revelation chapter 21, starting at verse 2, and we'll go all the way into Revelation chapter 22. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people." God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. I'm going to skip to verse 9. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and names written on them which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out as a square, its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. The construction of its wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third, etc., 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 12 stones. The twelve gates were of twelve pearls. Each individual gate was one of pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Notice, by the way, the street, singular, of the city was pure gold. We're not going to walk on streets of gold. There is a street, singular, of the city that was pure gold. Verse 22, But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon. That's what we referenced a minute ago. For the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. But there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And into into chapter 22 now we go for just a little bit more. He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. 
They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light. And they, in other words, we, will reign forever and ever. Amen. So, the new Jerusalem now that we're tagging on here to the new heavens and new earth. So, here we have the new heavens and new earth, literal, a literal place. And descending down to this literal new earth is a giant cube. Well, what do we make of this? First of all, um, well, maybe not first of all, but giant cubes descending from, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure that that part is literal. I think that part is figured, and we'll come back to that in just a second. In verse 2, the new Jerusalem is coming down out of heaven from God. Coming down out of heaven from God. This place where we're going, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven from God. Okay, This is described in verses 9 and 10 as the bride. Let's look at it one more time. Verse 9 and 10 He said, let me show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Let me show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And what did he show him? A giant cube. What he is showing him is the bride, the lamb's wife. And what he sees is a giant cube. Okay? Many miles width, breadth, and length. Okay? In other words... This giant cube, this city, New Jerusalem, is symbolic. It represents the bride, the wife of the Lamb. It represents us. We are the giant cube. We are the city, New Jerusalem. Okay? Now, it also says that God and the Lamb are the temple within this New Jerusalem. Think about Jerusalem, city of Jerusalem, right? Has a temple. Well, it doesn't right now, but it has had a temple in it. Right In the New Jerusalem, which is us, there is a temple in that New Jerusalem, and the temple is God himself. So get the picture. There's a symbolic picture of a giant cube, which is us. In this giant cube, which is us, is God himself. In other words, God and us together descend to the new earth. According to the scripture, the plainest reading of the text We do not fly away to meet God in heaven. He comes down with us to the new earth from heaven. That is verbatim what the story says. There's actually no specific mention of going to heaven, quote unquote, in the New Testament or even in the Old Testament. Now, Jesus says, great is your reward in heaven, okay? Um, There's much talk about the kingdom of heaven and so forth. There's talk about entering the kingdom of heaven. But that is not a place that we go as much as it is a reality to be realized, okay? What happens in the end is we and God come to inhabit this new earth together. We okay? Okay. I thought about starting off with a joke about the meeting Peter at the pearly gates. Uh, I didn't, mainly because I forgot, but to, to show you that th- this is kind of the, the way we think, of, oh, we're just going to kind of float up to this pearly gate somewhere, and there's going to be Peter. Not quite. Let's read the text, and let's get as much as we can um, from it, and then, then we'll let our imaginations begin to run wild. All right, I said a little bit of this earlier, but let me just say it again. So what what about heaven then? This idea of going to heaven, quote unquote. Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise to the thief on the cross. Today. Uh, Paul talks about when we die, we are with the Lord. In other words, something to the effect of, I'm perfectly happy to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. So that being with the Lord happens when we die. When the dead in Christ rise and when we meet them in the air and, and we, I say we, I'm, again, I'm assuming we'll all be alive, maybe not, but whatever, 
When, when Jesus comes back, and we have all this other stuff that we've already talked about, at the end of all that, we come back with him uh, to inhabit the new creation, the new earth. All right. Some symbolic numbers from this uh, passage here. You heard a lot of 12s. You heard some thousands. Okay, 12 gates uh, and 12 foundations. These uh, typically refer to uh, the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles. There's a lot of language here that describes Israel and the church as being uh, both foundational to this government, if you want to say it that way, in, in the end of time. Uh, we had the 24 thrones earlier in, in Revelation. Um, God's people, B.C. and A.D., if you want to say it that way, will be represented in heaven, if you want to say it that way. Um, but 12 represents government, and uh, the city is 12,000 furlongs, giant cube again. 12, again, represents government. 1,000 represents abundance and limitlessness and you know, cattle on a 1,000 hills. So this is going to be a place of perfect government. Uh, God himself will be in charge. It's also a place of abundant or limitless space and resource to do whatever it is that we need to do. The walls are 144 cubits. Again, of course, that's 12 times 12. So again, this is perfect government that will protect us. No evil will ever again enter. 12 stones, 12 pearls, and a gold street. All of these things represent perfection and purity. God and the Lamb are the temple. The temple is the place where worship occurs. So we will literally be coming into God himself to worship. There will be a union with God. There will be a unity um, that will be unlike anything we've ever experienced in this life. Tree of life with 12 fruits, healing the nations, the river of life, no more curse. All of this speaks of the restoration of all that was lost in Eden, total perfection, purity, and restoration. So to sum up, we have a literal new earth, and we have a symbolic new Jerusalem picture of us coming down with God to this literal new earth. Now, quickly, a hermeneutical sidebar. Hermeneutics meaning biblical interpretation. I want to ask the question, is it okay for me to interpret this this way, where part of it is literal and part of it is symbolic or figurative? Because that could be a challenge that somebody might challenge. Oh, you, you're, you're literal over here and you're figurative over here. Well, we do need to be careful about that. But very quickly, yes, I do think it's okay uh, for us to read it that way. And here's why I say that. This is a vision. Basically the same thing as a dream. Think about your dreams. And think about interpreting those dreams. Your dreams oftentimes will have a literal or a pre-known, a, a, a kind of a, a, a standard base, uh, B-A-S-E, base point from which the rest of the dream that's the weird part gets superimposed. Okay? Now think about John again. We said that Jesus had taught him that there was a passing away of heaven and earth, and surely he would have known about Peter's writing that would have said uh, that heaven and earth passes away and there will be a new heaven and a new earth, okay? These are his boys, okay? Jesus and Peter, he's aware that there's this idea that heaven and earth will pass away and there will be a new heaven and a new earth. This is not new with John 21, or with Revelation 21. It's not new idea. So when he has this vision, that part of the vision is makes sense to him. This is already what he would have understood. Yeah, heaven and earth will pass away. I see the new heavens and new earth. Now I see this giant cube. Now what's going on with that? Okay, and that's where the weird part of the vision happens, right? That's where the symbolism or the figurative part. Think about your dreams. Maybe you can think of one where you've had a dream where you had a, a, a real life part and then some weird part that was superimposed. I'll give you an example. I had a dream a couple years ago. My father and his wife were in the middle of Leesburg, Florida, on the side of the road, wrestling dragons. Well, I knew exactly where they were. On, I can take you to that street where they were. I can take you to the exact spot because I know where that is in real life. 
but I've never seen dragons there. Okay, and they're wrestling these dragons, and the dragon was the weird part that you had to kind of, that was figurative and symbolic. What's going on with that? Okay, well, a little bit later, um, several months later, my dad and his wife came down with COVID, and they had it very bad. And it took me a little while to figure it out, but I finally realized, hey, that's what this dream was talking about. Um, I, I don't believe that every case of COVID is necessarily demonic or whatever, but I think in their case, there was a demonic attachment of that that was, that was on them. And I, I called him up and I said, I've had this dream and you guys need to pray against this in a, in a kind of like take authority kind of a way. And, uh, but the dragons were that element of figurativeness that was added to the real. Now, here's the, here's the kicker. That spot where they were in Leesburg, Florida, that I can point to, it's right across the street from the hospital. So when I put it together, I was like, oh, that's what's happening. Like, this was foretelling that. And uh, we prayed against it, and they had already been praying against it. And uh, praise the Lord, they, they both came out of it. But it was, it was very touchy for a while. Okay, that's just an example. The point being... There's a real thing, and then the symbolic thing comes and is superimposed on that. So, do I believe that a literal giant cube will come out of the sky? No. I believe that we and the Lord will somehow inhabit, we, the New Jerusalem, will somehow inhabit a literal new planet Earth. All right. Moving on. Life in the new paradigm. So, we've talked about the new heaven and the new Earth. And we've talked about the New Jerusalem. By the way, in Revelation 21, 22, there's one verse that says new heaven and new earth, and there's no more sea. Verse 2, all the way to the end, talks about New Jerusalem. So there's this real line of demarcation between the literal in verse 1 and then everything that comes after, which is this symbolic picture of us and God together for eternity. All right, you have a worksheet there that has a few thoughts uh, for us to consider here about what, will be, what life will be like in the new paradigm. So let's go through it. First of all, glorified bodies. Now, we actually have quite a bit of uh, testimony of Jesus in particular uh, after the resurrection for us to get a pretty good picture, I think, of what it might look like for us to be in glorified bodies. Now, I'm not sure that there's anything that says that our glorified bodies have to be exactly like his, um, but with nothing else to go on, I think we can kind of take that as an assumption. Um, so let's look at it. Um, couple of, a couple of things that uh, Scripture says about Jesus after the resurrection that might help us to get an idea of what a glorified body is like. Remember on the road to Emmaus, the two dudes, and Jesus comes up and talks to them for a little while. Um, when, when, he, when, he's, when Jesus is talking to these two dudes, they didn't look at him, oh my goodness, what, who, what is this monster? You know, Or they didn't like freak out. Why? Because apparently he looked human. Okay? So I think we can probably assume that our glorified bodies will look human. Uh, he, had, he didn't have a look that they took note of and said, oh, my goodness, what is this? Okay. Uh, another point here. Remember when uh, he was talking to Mary and Mary did not recognize him? Um, also, the fellows on the road to Emmaus didn't recognize him. And later on, the disciples didn't recognize him. Um, but then they did. So in Mary's case, he said, Mary, and she saw him, and she knew who it was. In the uh, fellows, the road to Emmaus case, they, when he broke the bread, their eyes were opened. So they're looking at him, but they don't see him until something kind of flips a switch. And so even though we look human, I, I said this, we might not look the same as we look now. Like, if you see me in eternity, I might not look like I look now, but I probably will look human. 
if we're to take Jesus after the resurrection as, as the assumption of what, we, what our glorified bodies will look like. Um, the disciples, it says in John, uh, the end of, end of the Gospel of John, when they were with Jesus, none of them dared to ask, who are you? I find that to be a curious phrase. Why would they even say that? Um, I mean, why would that be in there? Because to me it says that he looked somewhat different, such that they knew who he was in a spiritual way, such that it makes this, sen- this statement make sense. They, none of them said, who are you? Because they knew it was him. Well, why would you even say that if you just look like you? you no? Know? What about wounds to our natural bodies? Now, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to speculate a little bit here. I, I, maybe, maybe somebody has a better take on this. I don't know. But, you know, when Jesus came and, he, you know, he's talking to Thomas and he said, you know, put your hands in my wounds. And so he still has these wounds. Okay. But it doesn't say anything about all the other wounds that he had. I mean, think about the guys on the road to Emmaus. You know, if, he, if he's looking like he looked three days ago, they'd look at him, one look at him and say, oh, my goodness, can we help you? Can we get you something? Like, I mean, he would have been thrashed, right? So why does he have the wounds to the hands and feet and side, but he doesn't have all the more uh, surface-level wounds? I mean, there's, there's more than surface-level, but you get my drift. So what about that? I, I don't know. I, I'll speculate. I'm just going to take a guess that there's a healing process. And the surf, and it's a very quick healing process. Such that all of his wounds, by the time he got up out of the grave and started seeing people, started healing immediately, but the larger wounds took more time to heal. I wonder if in eternity, when Jesus returns, I wonder if we'll, ha- if we'll see his wounds. I wonder if they will be, have been healed. And I, here, here, here's what, another reason why I say that. Think about people that die terrible deaths of like, you know, getting chopped up by a whatever, okay? All right, when they, when they rise from the dead, they're going to rise in wholeness in their glorified body. Um, and, and so, w- will there be a period of healing, fast, hopefully, uh, but a period of healing of those bodies in that process? So they come back together, and, and they are they are healed. Um, I don't know. Just that's just a fun little thing to imagine. Um, here's another thing that we can imagine about. Not imagine. This is seems to be pretty true from scripture. We will get hungry and we will eat. Okay, we talked about fish earlier. I don't know if it's fish, but we'll get hungry and we'll eat. Jesus ate fish and bread and honeycomb, um, but we will never lack or starve. And so whatever it feels like to get hungry, it, it won't be like, oh, I feel terrible. Okay. Generally speaking, I think we will be subject to the laws of nature. Think about Jesus. After the resurrection, he walked around. In other words, gravity uh, was still winning versus Jesus, if I can say it that way. However, he did walk up into that locked room with all the doors shut, didn't he? So there's both a general principle of adhering to the laws of nature, i.e. gravity, And there's also this transcending the laws of nature. Will we be able to kind of translate wherever we want? Um, One way that, again, this is speculation, but one way this might work is when do we get together with God? Okay, let's say, and I'll just throw something out there. Let's say it's once a week. Let's say we're doing our thing for six days a week, and then one day out of every week, we come together in this grandest of worship services, okay? Again, this is, this is, uh, uh, what, 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 what if we, 
what if we just translate ourselves over to Jerusalem for the worship service every week? Okay? Again, it's just, it's just some playful imagination, but I think it's good for us to kind of just think about what life might be like. Am I trying to teach doctrine? No. Am I trying to help you to imagine what might it be like? Yes, I am. All right, so there, there's, a, there's a sense of adhering to the laws of nature, but there's also a sense that we might be able to do some things that are outside of the laws of nature. We currently use 10% of our brains, so they say. I think we'll probably be using 100% of our brains, and again, all, all of our senses will be heightened. What we see, what we taste, what we hear, what we smell, what we feel, will just be all kinds of... Um, Wonderful, yeah, that's right. All right, so moving on from glorified bodies. How about marriage? Matthew twenty-two thirty, 30, Jesus says that in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. This is another one where, depending on what your marriage is like, you may be cheering for joy, or you may be disappointed in this, Right? But again, that's not, the right, that's not the right perspective. Whatever it is in heaven is going to be better than what it is now. So you're not going to be disappointed. You're not going to be missing out because there's no marriage. Okay. Um, why is there no marriage? Because there's a marriage. We will be involved in the ultimate marriage. We, the bride, will be married to... Christ, okay? And so there is one ultimate marriage in heaven. We will all be enacting the great corporate marriage of Jesus and his bride. Marriage in this life points us to the marriage of the next life, union with Christ and with each other. We will see God face to face. We will know him as we are known. We will be partakers in the divine nature. Whatever we will be doing, it's going to be better than marriage. It's going to be more relational. Whatever passes away from old earth will not be missed. Now, I don't want to get graphic about this, but just imagine some of the best natural feelings and sensations that as human beings we can have on this side of eternity. Multiply it times 100. Our relationship with God will be ecstatic, and it's not going to be something you would ever want to miss. Is it uh, constant and consistent? Probably not. But uh, there will be uh, great times of, um, of ecstasy. There will be some eternal version of, of, of the things that the, the good things of this life point us to the better things of the next life. We will feel and know his presence in a way that we have only dim and cloudy glimpses of here. All right, I want to say something about kingly rewards. Look at Revelation 21, 24. And let's get this little piece about kings. It says in this new Jerusalem that the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. What is meant here? And again, some speculation here, but... I mentioned this a little bit previously. There will be rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. He will hand out rewards. When we get to the judgment seat, this is what I think is going to happen. When we get to the judgment seat, the first thing, this is, I'm, not, I'm talking about us. I'm talking about believers right now. The first thing that will happen is you will come into a great knowing of your own self and of all that has been. You will come to a realization of all that you could have had in God. You will come to a realization that you could have done X, Y, and Z, and you didn't. You will come to a full realization of all of your motives over your life. There will be a moment of regret, a moment of sorrow, a moment of, I wish I had done things differently. Because you'll know 
who you really are. And I think we'll come to that judgment seat and the vast majority of us will feel pretty low. And then he will wipe every tear from our eyes. He'll say to us, yes, there were things that were missed, but you believed, you, be you trusted in me to bring you through, and here you are. Now, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter my kingdom. Wipe every tear from your eye. And from that point forward, never again will you shed a tear. Never again will you have a regret. Never again will you look back and say, I could have done this, that, or the other. And for eternity, we'll have no regrets, no sorrows. That right there is worth it by itself. But there's, there's way more than that, but that is a big one for me. So he'll give us at that point our rewards. In other words, our crowns, okay? Who are kings? We're all kings. Revelation 1, 6, we're all kings and priests. But kings over what? In order to be a king, you have to have a... What are we kings over? What is a kingdom? A kingdom is people. Which leads me to believe that there might be sort of some levels or some hierarchy or some authority that we will have different levels of authority in this new system um, based on, and we've heard it said from this pulpit before, that uh, you know, our current life is our resume. And uh, we will be rewarded different levels of rewards. We do not earn salvation. We do not earn our ticket to heaven or anything like that. We work not to get in, but we work for rewards. And so we're, we're all kings, but the, the least in the kingdom of heaven, who's he king over? You know? So when it says the kings will bring their honor and so forth, I was talking about this with Samantha the other day. And I said something about the kings bringing their honor, and she said, well, who are the kings? I said, you know who I think the kings are? I think the kings are my grandmother who never learned to drive, raised a family, very meek and mild, has really nothing to speak of to say this is what I did with my life other than raise four children to know the Lord and, and to be trained in the Lord and, and was submitted to her husband and was just one of the kindest people that I ever knew. And you'd look at that person and say, well, you know, that's a nobody. And... and not only would I not be surprised, but I fully expect that that is the kind of person who simply lived a life devoted to God, no ambition, no, no trying to um, do or be anything than just what she was, which was a daughter of God. That's the kind of person I think that will be a king in heaven, and will be given great authority. I am no, I am under no um, deception that clergy in this life will have more authority than laity in the next life. In fact, in most cases, I would say just the opposite. And so, when I teach and when I do whatever it is that we do. Oftentimes, I am reminded and I'm, I'm humbled to, to know most of the people I'm talking to very well may be in authority over me in the next life. So I say that to simply say, what we do now is important. And uh, just pursue God with your whole heart and, and with, a, with a, a meekness and, and, a, and a just wanting to do right. 
and see what will happen on the other side. Now, even the king that's king over nobody uh, is still going to have a good time in heaven. And the Bible says that John the Baptist, uh, who's the greatest pre-Jesus, is the least in the kingdom of heaven. So the, the least of the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. So again, there's no disappointment, uh, but if you want more authority and more, more, if you want more reward in heaven, follow God with a humble heart. All right, keep going. Purpose fulfilled, part D. Why do I say that there's going to be purpose fulfilled? Because I believe there's going to be purpose, purpose fulfilled. If you, if you think about the beginning of Revelation 22, where it talks about the river of life, the tree of life, no more curse, that's a clear reference to everything in Eden being restored. And so what happened in Eden? There was a purpose. God created man to have dominion. God put man in the garden to work it. All of these things that were the original intention will be restored and escalated. God wants what he wanted originally, but now there's the original intention plus more. Um, You've heard it said many times from this pulpit that we will be working in heaven because the original intention of work will be realized. That's a good thing. Um, You know, when, when we think work, we think, oh my goodness, what are the negatives of work? You're in a work situation that you don't like would be like spinning your wheels, uh, the grind or your boring work. What would be aspects of work that we would not think are good, right? Spinning our wheels, grind, boring, feeling like we're not useful, not effective, feeling like we're not valued, and just flat out being tired. Well, none of those things that are, we associate with work are going to be part of the work there because all of the effects of the curse will be gone. So your work will be ultimately uh, invigorating. You won't be spinning your wheels. You'll be invigorated. You won't be in a grind. You'll be invigorated. You won't be bored. You'll be uh, happy with what you're doing. You won't feel not useful. You'll feel very useful and effective. You will have a full realization that you are fulfilling your purpose and, and doing the Lord's bidding and giving glory to him. You won't feel not valued. You'll feel very valued. You'll feel like you're a part of what God wants. And you'll feel that value. And you certainly won't be tired uh, because you'll have a glorified body that will just go and go like the Energizer Bunny. Boy, that's dating me, isn't it? Okay. Um, We have a faculty member in the School of Music who's retiring 40 years as the director of bands. And he made a statement that he... He got, for 40 years, he got to do what he loved to do. I thought, that's so great. But also, that describes almost no one. More and more it describes people because we really live in a time and a place where we can pursue education and we can pursue a calling and we can pursue those things that we feel like the Lord is calling us to. But for most people in the history of planet Earth, they, and that wasn't even a thought that I could try to go after something that would be um, pleasant for me to do in terms of my work. Very few people can have that testimony. But in that time, we will have that testimony. Imagine going to work and feeling like you are fulfilling your purpose perfectly. There's almost no better feeling in the world on this side of eternity. And so that's going to be a very... Um, um, pleasant feeling to feel like you're going and fulfilling your purpose in eternity. Again, there's, there's no more regret. I talked about in a message a couple years ago that my one, I don't, I don't fear much except I fear that I'll get to the end of my life and I would have missed some steps and that I would not have fulfilled my purpose or my destiny in this life. I still feel that way some, but after studying this, I feel that way a lot less because even then, I will simply say, yeah, I missed it. And yeah, there could have been some different twists and turns. And I could have gotten a lot more out of life. But you know what? I got the rest of eternity to fix all that. And you might be sitting here tonight and you might be saying, man, you know, I, I, I've, I've given a lot over my life. And I, I've, I've, I've had twists and turns. And, and you know, I, I don't feel all that fulfilled. 
And I don't, I don't feel that um, maybe I could have done better, I could have done more, I could have done something, this or that or the other. Put those thoughts out of your mind. You literally have the everlasting dominion to fulfill your purpose, not only in a better way than what you fulfilled it in this life, but perfectly fulfilling your purpose for eternity. It's going to be marvelous. Finally, in the new heavens and new earth, God will be there. This is a little bit of a recapitulation of some things I said earlier. John Piper said it this way, if you're only, if you're only concerned about heaven and, and wanting to get there is to get relief, you're not going. Now that's strong, and it's probably stronger than what I would have said. But the point he's making is, if we're just thinking about heaven as being, oh, it's going to be better. It's going to be better than here. Oh, we get to walk on streets of gold. Oh, we'll get to sing songs. Oh, we'll get to do what? You've really missed the point. And all those things are great. There, there was a song when I was, I don't know, probably a kid, maybe a young teenager. I bowed on my knees and cried holy. And it talked about, the verse talked about how, um, you know, I got, I got to see such and such person, and I got to see some of my relatives that I hadn't seen in a long time, and I enjoyed doing that, and, you know, that's all these beautiful things. And, but then I said, I want to see Jesus. He's the one that died for me. If your heart doesn't have the understanding that really the point of this thing is I get to be with God, then you've really missed the point. I shouldn't have to tell you all the great things because all the great things pale in comparison to you get to be with God. And you get to not not be with God. Because we are talking about eternity tonight for those who are His. If you're not His, that's a totally different thing. And so not only do we get to escape the utter uh, yes, futility, I was going to say nightmare, of being cast out from the presence of God into this lake of fire. Not only is we get all that, but we get to come into this place the greatest selling point for heaven is that God will be there. At the end of a series this long and at the end of a message where we have been talking about eternal destinies, I believe I would be remiss not to give you a chance to say, yes, I want this. I do not want to be in that place separated from God, and I do want to be in the place where I am with God. And so I would just simply ask if that's you, um, just get up out of your chair and come up here. We want to pray and uh, help lead you in a prayer where we will help you to um, receive God's free gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. So just go ahead and do that right now. Leave your seat and come up here and, and we'll pray. I'll give just a second for that. Praise the Lord. And one more. Maybe you are seeing tonight for the first time uh, that there's more to life than just raising your hand and walking down the aisle and saying a little prayer. Not only do we do something in this life beyond just 
believe, quote unquote. But we want to do things that honor God, and there is a a real um, propriety to pursuing rewards in heaven. It's a good thing.